Hi everyone, Rob here from Elasto Proxy, and I'm uh, actually in Calgary, and I'm here with Nathan Armstrong from Armstrong Electric Vehicles, and also he is the CTO of Aptera. Welcome, Nathan. Thank you. Thank you for actually doing this, and thank you so much for allowing us to walk around your shop. It's my pleasure. Yeah, great to have you guys here, and uh, always good to support Canadian industry. So more than happy to. So Nathan. Talk to us, like, who is Nathan Armstrong? Oh my goodness, well, uh, <laughs> I moved up to Canada about 14 years back from Southern California. Okay. Um, uh, Work-wise, I've always kind of been in prototyping, uh, engineering. Uh, worked uh, since 97, building concept cars and various uh, vehicles and whatever weird things the uh, automakers <laughs> could dream up, you know. We would essentially build uh, cars for the car shows, that kind of stuff, early prototypes. and. Um, just kind of got into doing that world, and it's a very interesting world. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, you've got a blend of aerospace and a blend of um, a marine and a blend of like arts and crafts. You know, you're just cutting bits of paper with scissors and that kind of stuff. It's very fun to be on the like developmental and the design side of, of uh, vehicle development. Uh, that's kind of where I like to I like to work, and uh, I find it's. Uh, um, uh, globally interesting from like so many perspectives. It's like one of the only industries I think where it encompasses a little piece of everything. You know, like if you're an aerospace guy, you're pretty much there. If you're a medical guy, you're there. If you're, but in automotive, it's like you're pulling from every industry to try and find the best solution. You have to push the limits. And push the limits and you're always looking for what's the better way to do something, right? Because you're always trying to save money. So it's always like, how do you do Absolutely. it cheaper? So how do we look at something else? And how do we, what's going on over here? So um, it's a big melting pot of technologies. Right. And then you've got stuff like upholstery and glass and like more traditional kind of stuff, which is again, you're still trying to find the limits of what you can do with upholstery, but it's still sewing, which is nice because it's still a sewing machine and it's still very analog, right? Absolutely. So I like, uh, I like all the different aspects of that kind of, the challenges that come with automotive and vehicles and, and the human aspects and trying to make people comfortable and trying to make people feel safe in whatever you're building to, you know, that it's, it's uh, accommodating for the human being, you know. Armstrong Electric Vehicles. Mm -hmm. What made you go in that direction? Well, um, it's important to make jobs. And it's important to like, I think, uh, try and participate in the economy. You know, I moved to this country and it was like, the country's been nice to me and it's like, okay, you know, so I, I know some things, how to put those things into action to try and make some jobs. It was really the, the, the thing of it, right? And, you know, if we make a cool vehicle in the meantime, and you know, some people think it's neat, and we sell some. I mean, that's that's kind of the goal. But I mean, really, the thing is to try and make jobs, um, and make jobs doing stuff that people, you know, like to do. Right? They like to do things that they're proud of, and build things that's good quality. And you know, we think Canada's got a good reputation for building things of quality, and we're just kind of plugging into that same that same vein of things. But um, yeah, the idea is to try and build a company that can build vehicles in Western Canada. Uh, you know, vehicles that are kind of uh, more designed for the Canadian market and Canadian, you know, usage and a bit more rugged and a bit more kind of durable and a bit more able to take abuse, that kind of stuff. And um, we started with the bikes just because the bikes is, is the easiest entry point of the market. It's the smallest and cheapest thing we can we can do right now. And as you can see, we've got seven sitting there. It doesn't take a lot of room. No, not at all. You know, so it's uh, for a small shop with the limited resources, it's an it's a easy uh, kind of entry point. And, um, yeah, the goal is to build more of these and build a buggy and build more uh, vehicles that, you know, kind of uh, represent the best of Canadian sort of thinking and bringing in some good technology with some, you know, more kind of classic things and kind of making a nice mashup of things that are trying to be, like, truly Canadian in our approach to how we, how we design and build things, right? And, you know, I think that's, there's, a, there's a niche there for us, because no one's really, really doing that. You know, no, not really. I don't think so. But yeah. I like what you said, it's, it's you're, you're not, you're not putting quality aside. Oh, no. That's, that's the like, number one. That's number one. Absolutely. Uh, that's and that's the great thing. And looking, walking around your shop and watching and showing, and I was able to touch and feel, and you can actually feel that there's quality that it's not oh, no. a cheap piece of metal or cheap plastic that's being put on there. Yeah. It's being put with thought. And yeah. like you were saying before, you were testing a lot of the items, and you mm -hmm. don't just put something on the bike just to put on it. It gets tested and. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like three generations is kind of like the, the rule of thumb, right? Okay. Like you should be able to give this to your grandkids, and it should still be working. That's, that's kind of why I think it's a successful product, right? Okay. I mean, at least like one person's whole lifetime. Without, I mean, that, that, that should be enough, right? I think we can do better than that, right? I'd like to see it go. I love that approach. Like these ones have a place you can sign it and then a place for your grandkids to sign it and your great grandkids and they can all pass it down like an heirloom sort of thing. Like oh, wow. it, you know, okay. this thing electric vehicle, there's nothing moves on this vehicle. Like there's literally nothing to break down. 
right? If there's the real bearings in the chain and tires, then that's it, right? So there's no reason this shouldn't be running a thousand years from now. Wow. So why not make it good quality, right? Why not make it so it can last 100%. a long time? And again, I think, you know, being Canadian and trying to represent, you know, the best of Canada, I really like that Canada has a reputation for making good quality stuff. And we're trying to like, just kind of maintain that and bring a bit of that to Western Canada too. So people out here can kind of get a taste of Absolutely. You know, the automotive market too, so. And on, on the other side, you got involved with Aptera. Mm -hmm. So maybe talk a bit about that. Mm, yeah, that was back in, <clears throat> so it was back when I was living in California. Um, Jason Hill, who's the designer, he was a buddy, we just done a project together. He uh, just called me out of the blue and he says, hey, we've got this crazy aerodynamic project in San Diego. I'm just going back to go meet these guys. Are you interested in getting involved, right? You have them engineering. And I was like, yeah, that sounds great. So that was like 2002, something like that, like way back, 2003 maybe. And um, we went and met these guys and they had this prototype. And I still got the Buffalo Mechanics magazine with them in the desert with a diesel engine in the back and they got 300 miles per gallon. And um, they raised a million bucks, right? So they got a million bucks and they were like, okay, we got a million bucks. We've got this prototype, like, what do we do, right? <laughs> so Jason and I, we just kind of like went through, like I engineered it, Jason designed it. And we went through the first, like the first type one vehicle and the type two, which we put little windows in. And then the type three, which is a little different again. Um, and yeah, it was a, it was a very interesting like piece of history back that kind of time frame. Uh, a lot of uh, good orders, a lot of good positive uh, feedback from the, from people, and everyone's like, "This is great." Um, uh, the company itself, we um, there were some issues with, um, with the board of directors and like the, 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 the team from Detroit that showed up to try and like help manage the project. Like we were basically too successful, so the board of directors decided that we need like Detroit people to help, and they came and they just made an absolute mess of things and. Um, Two years later, that company was essentially gone. Right? So that was, that was a big shame. Um, the IP was bought by a gentleman in, in San Diego, and he sat on it. Unfortunately, he passed away in 2019, and his widow phoned up Christmas Eve and said, hey, do you, want, do you want your project back? Wow. And they were like, yes. <laughs> right? So uh, uh, they put the, um, um, a little uh, kind of invitation out for somebody who might want to invest, get it going again. They did it like Monday morning, but Monday, Monday lunchtime, they had the money in the bank. Like, you know, they're like, hey, you want to get going on a project again? This was like November 2019. And I was like, hell yeah, right? It's like Blues Brothers, right? We're getting the band back together, right? Like, we're going to do this, right? So like Jason, you know, I got back involved and we had some money and then like I started working on it. And then come June 2020, we had the vehicle like engineered and we we're building it. And the rest is history now. We're wow. Series B, 40 million raised. We've got 150 employees. Um, you know, and you're still scaling, it's still going, like you're still looking for, yeah, yeah, yeah. always looking for people to work and oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is scaling up, this is... Oh, uh, big time, big time, yeah. And like we were saying earlier too, now there's this, all of a sudden there's a solar vehicle market now. And Aptera now is like, because it's now a thing, right? It just raises the little niche that we had, it just takes us up another level, right? So now not only we like the most aerodynamic, the most efficient vehicle, now we've got the solar thing and it's like this whole, we've kind of like just, you know, those moments where you're like, wow, we seem to be just at the right time this time. I think <laughs> yeah. we're just at the right time this time. Like when we did it 10 years back, it was probably too early. Um, yeah. Battery technology's improved a bit, you know. I don't think people accepted it as much either back then, right? Not as much. The idea was still accepted, but there wasn't like the need, the pressing need to have like much better efficiency. Back today? Right, yes, exactly. Even electricity prices now for a gas car, but the electric car are going up to the point where people are like, what's the alternative? And it seems that kind of we've hit the nail on the head with this one, so. That's, it's incredible, the, and like you said, the car is designed purely for efficiency. That's, uh, that was the whole premise from the very beginning. Like Steve's whole thing was um, like, what's the, the most efficient car you can possibly design? And let's start with that. And then everyone else is just gonna have to try and catch up. Right? This is like, <laughs> what are you gonna do from there? Like you can't beat the design. No, So uh, not at all. So um, And to be able to fit yeah. solar panels yeah. On there, and you get what's the charge? Like, what do you get on, on the autonomy on the solar panel? For, for 40 miles a day wow. in Southern California. Right? That's insane. But even up in Alberta here, like, this is the sunniest um, place in Canada. So it's not necessarily hot, but it's still sunny. So even up here, you get 20, 30 miles a day. Which, is more, which is more than enough Way, on yeah. the average of uh, yeah. a community. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 And then because it is such a small battery pack, even if you plug it into a 110, Funny enough, you actually get like a decent amount of charge in an hour to get you around, right? So yep. it's, it's, there's other advantages too for being Absolutely. like very efficient, right? So. Where do you see EV going? Because it's become the thing. It's become, I don't want to say the flavor of the month because it's more than the flavor of the month, but it's become yeah. such a, a headline. Yeah. Where do you see EV going? Are we at the beginning of it? 
Mm, I don't think we are actually. I think <clears throat> I don't know if you saw that thing recently on wind turbines when they buried all those wind turbine blades, and it was a big controversy because there was like a, they literally like buried like hundreds of massive wind turbine blades out of the desert. They just buried them because they were all out of life and they were now no longer useful. And everyone's like, wait, hang on a minute. That's supposed to be a clean technology, right? <laughs> what are you guys doing? You buried, that's not clean, right? Look at all that waste it's producing, right? EV, same thing. EVs are, it's gonna save the world, EVs are great. Battery production, from an environmental standpoint, nah, yeah. right? nah, that's not great. And limited resources there too, right? Oil and gas is gonna run out. Well, we're gonna run out of cobalt, whatever it was, right? It's gonna be harder and harder to get. So, um, the amount of batteries that are required to be manufactured to keep up with the demand of the curve of EVs is, it's just not feasible. It's not feasible. It's okay. not feasible. Okay. It's just not that much raw material on the planet. So batteries are going to become a commodity. And the use of batteries and the intelligent use of batteries is going to become, I think, more of a driving factor than it is today. Okay. Like today, you just put as many batteries as you can on whatever you're building, and there's it's your vehicle. Yeah. There you go, right? There's your range, there you go. But I mean, <clears throat> the amount of batteries that are being used in some of these new big EVs, it's, it's mind-blowing. Like we could take the same amount of batteries and build 20 amp teras with that same battery using one vehicle, right? So what's the more intelligent use of those batteries of that resource, right? Okay. So I don't think EVs are going to just going to linearly continue to take over. I think we're going to see people going to start saying, wait, hang on a minute, we're using all these resources now to EVs. Is this the best thing to do, right? Is hydrogen going to make a bit of a comeback? Because now hydrogen is, you know, it's a pretty good option, right? Yeah. You know, when EVs start becoming, you know, not the big darling child anymore, maybe hydrogen will come back. Maybe battery technology will improve. 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 Everyone's been talking about this for forever now. You know, let's get to the point of like mass commercialization with whatever battery technology you want to like invent and then get that adopted into the market is such a risk. At this point, no one's really varying too far from the lithium ion, lithium ion kind of technology. So we're not seeing any massive improvements. We're seeing improvements in charge cycle time. Yep. That's a big one we're seeing now from like 10,000 charge cycles to like 100,000 charge cycles. That's a big deal, right? That means now your battery lasts three times the length of the vehicle, which means as a price of vehicle owner, you're paying for a third of the battery. Oh, which is a big deal, right? Okay. Unless your vehicle is going to last 100,000 charge cycles, like the Altero might, because it's composite and it's not going to rust, right? So maybe it would spool up. But anyway, so the length of the battery is going to improve, but the density, the weight, and the cost all seem to be staying the same. Sort of staying the same. So, like, you know, so there's not going to be any real. I don't know. Like pretty soon, people, like you see more and more environmentalist like stories about battery production. You're gonna see more of that. You're gonna see more people pushing back on, you know. And I think that's gonna start changing the, the trend a bit. Okay. Towards more, not away from EVs, but just towards more intelligent EVs, smaller EVs, more like city EVs, like the stuff that Citroen's doing, and like you know, people are doing more in Europe, kind of like smaller cars. Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense because you only got a small battery, small car. You're not going very far. No. Makes sense. Absolutely. Right. You put you put uh, batteries in a F350. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't make any sense. Well, I, I, I have a Wrangler EV. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I understand what you're talking about. It's pure electric or is it a hybrid? It's a hybrid. Okay. It's a, it's a hybrid vehicle. So you get 50, 50 kilometers on a, on a full charge, but right. depending on how you drive and right. how the wind conditions well, are. There's tires on that thing. And there's big right. tires on that thing. It's not a good <laughs> idea, right? It's just not good. Yeah, it's not good. efficient. No. It's not an efficient design of the vehicle. No. no. So if you're looking for efficiency, you know, so anyway, I think people have to start thinking more efficient, which is going to cause a whole bunch of good things. Then, yeah, absolutely. Right? Everyone will start getting a bit more kind of just conscientious about um, this massive, like available area, you know, called aerodynamics and light weighting that really not many OEMs have really even like entered that like realm of like, oh, what can we do to try and make our vehicles more efficient? Like Mercedes-Benz have come out with a vehicle now that's really aerodynamic, um, but it's still really heavy, right? So you know, you're only gonna get so far with that, right? So absolutely. anyway, so anyway, but that's more like, you know, that's a bit of aircraft thinking coming into the auto industry. You know, there's a bit of aerospace coming in, right? Which is gonna change prices and change how people think about building cars. And so it's, it's, it's a, there's a revolution happening all the time in the auto industry, but you only see it two years later when the vehicles are actually out. Right? But like, internally right now, a lot of companies are really trying to figure out what, and what are they gonna do? You know, like what is gonna be the future? That's a good question. You know, right? That's and a good question. No one knows. No one knows. <laughs> no one has any idea. <laughs> right? Gas engines, I mean, they're not going away. And they keep getting no. better. And they keep getting more efficient, you know. So, I mean, you might have some big breakthroughs in two-stroke technology, who knows? Or something, right? Or some kind of like synthetic fuel that comes out that is super clean. Like, who knows? Who knows? So, anyway, we're betting on small vehicles that don't use a lot of batteries. So, we're not like committing a huge amount of resources to any particular. Right. right? Same with the bike, same with Aptera, same with all this stuff. It's, it's an efficient use of materials is the main thing. Cool. Yeah. Nathan, I don't want to take too much of your time because I know you're a busy guy. 
as you guys can see. Uh, but on behalf of the Lasso Proxy, my name is Roberto Nacarado. I want to thank Nathan Armstrong again for taking his time with us and uh, looking forward to see what you come up with next. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you guys. Thank you for coming out. Have a good one, everyone.